This video is sponsored by Equals. I think there's this notion that making money is evil, right? It's like rooted all the way back down to money is the root of all evil. People think that the bankers steal our money. And, you know, it's somewhat true in that in a lot of the world, there's a lot of theft going on all the time. The history of the world, in some sense, is this predator-prey relationship between makers and takers. There are people who go out and create things and build things and work hard on things. And then there are people who come along and take with a sword or a gun or taxes or crony capitalism or communism or what have you. There's all these different methods to steal. Even in nature, there are more parasites than there are non-parasitical organisms. You have a ton of parasites in you who are living off of you. And the better ones are symbiotic, they're giving something back. But there are a lot that are just taking. That's just the nature of how any complex system is built. But what I am focused on is true wealth creation. It's not about taking money. It's not about taking something from somebody else, but it's from creating abundance. Obviously, there's not a finite number of jobs or a finite amount of wealth. Otherwise, we would still be sitting around in caves, figuring out how to divide up pieces of firewood and, you know, the occasional dead deer. So most of the wealth and civilization, in fact, not most, all of it has been created. And it got created from somewhere. It got created from people. It got created from technology, it got created from productivity, it got created from hard work. So this idea that it's stolen is, I think, this horrible zero-sum game that people who are trying to gain status play. But the reality is everyone can be rich. It is merely a question of education and desire. You have to want it. If you don't want it, that's fine. Then you opt out of the game. But don't try and put down the people who are playing the game because that's the game that keeps you in a comfortable, warm bed at night. That's the game that keeps a roof over your head. That's a game that keeps your supermarket stock. That's the game that keeps the iPhone buzzing in your pocket. So it is a beautiful game that is worth playing ethically, rationally, morally, socially for the human race. And it's going to continue to make us all richer and richer until we have massive wealth creation for anybody who wants it. So wealth is a very positive sum game. We create things together. We're starting this endeavor to create this hopefully piece of art that explains what we're doing. At the end of it, something brand new will be created. It's a positive sum game. Status, on the other hand, is a zero sum game. It's a very old game. We've been playing it since monkey tribes. And it's hierarchical. Who's number one? Who's number two? Who's number three? And for number three to move to number two, number two has to move out of that slot. So status is a zero sum game. Politics is an example of a status game. Even sports is an example of a status game. To be the winner, there must be a loser. I don't fundamentally love status games. They play an important role in our society, so we figure out who's in charge. But fundamentally, you play them because they're a necessary evil. The problem is on an evolutionary basis, like if you go back thousands of years, status is a much better predictor of survival than wealth is. You couldn't have wealth before the farming age, before farmers, because you couldn't store things. Hunter-gatherers carried everything on their backs. So hunter-gatherers lived entirely in status-based societies. Farmers started going to wealth-based societies, and the modern industrial economies are much more heavily wealth-based societies. But there's always a subtle competition going on between status and wealth. For example, when journalists attack rich people or they attack the technology industry, they're really bidding for status. They're saying, no, the people are more important, and I, the journalist, represents the people, and therefore I am more important. The problem is that by playing these status games, to win at a status game, you have to put somebody else down. That's why you should avoid status games in your life, because they make you into an angry, combative person. You're always fighting to put other people down, to put yourself and the people that you like up. And they're always going to exist. There's no way around it. But just realize that most of the times when you're trying to create wealth, you're actually getting attacked by someone else. And they're trying to look like a goody two shoes. But really what they're doing is they're trying to up their own status at your expense. I think people have to be very careful to not get trapped along the way with things that you can afford with your current lifestyle, like the way you're living and the, the way you're earning, yeah. but they're also imprisoning you in the fact that you are now going to have to work this 40 hour a week job in order to get this thing that you can afford, but now you, you're saddled down to this job. You've no, you're not saving, you're not, you're not putting things in a, in a good place, and you're working for these things. 
Working for things as rewards right. is a real trap that a lot of people fall into. It's the biggest one. You know, Nassim Taleb also says that uh, you know, there are two great addictions, heroin and a monthly salary. <laughs> 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 right? and, and that's why you can't get rich renting out your time. Because yes. even when you start charging more and more for your time, it's a slow upgrade loop. And then you upgrade your house at the same time. Yeah. You upgrade your car at the same time. You move in the neighborhood. You really also have to get used to ignoring your peers or upgrading or changing the definition of your peers. There are, a lot right. of, there are a lot of people here who are poor here, but they would be rich if they were living in Thailand and Bali. And if they have the luxury of a remotely doable job, they may want to be living there uh, and saving up money. But the ignoring the peers is an issue because the keeping up with the Joneses is a real phenomenon. Yeah, envy makes the world go around. Right? Yeah. How does one escape nine to five? Um, so uh, escaping the nine to five grind is actually very difficult. Uh, and one of the big problems that many of us have in life, and I faced this early on too, is you, you just get sucked into being busy. And you get sucked into being busy because you have a job. The job kind of chews up all of your time from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You get home, you're exhausted. How are you supposed to work on anything else? So uh, I, I think the key there is trying to find a career or a job or an education where you will end up in a business where the inputs and the outputs are disconnected. But what I mean by that is, um, let's say that you were growing up in uh, you know, the world 2000 years ago, almost all the jobs you could have back then, the inputs and the outputs are very tightly connected. So if you go and you, uh, you, know, you have to go cut wood, you spend four hours cutting wood, you get four hours worth of cutting wood output. Uh, there'll be very slight difference between the two. Uh, but nowadays, you have knowledge worker jobs, you have intellectual jobs, uh, programming being my favorite example, where a good developer can write a piece of code that can literally make your business hundreds of millions of dollars for the next few years. And there are developers who can, who can write code all day long. Uh, and you know, just because they're creating the wrong thing, it's actually not creating value no matter how hard they work. So yeah, customers don't care about inputs. They only care about outcomes and outputs. So if you can, if you can navigate towards a career where you're tracked on the output, uh, you're going to do much better. What are examples of careers? So I gave coding as an example, but actually sales is another one of those examples, and especially very expensive sales, uh, very high-end sales. Uh, so like if you're out there, uh, for example, if you're selling houses, if you're a real estate agent, right? Not a great job necessarily, very, very crowded. But if you're a top flight real estate agent, you know how to market yourself, you know how to sell houses, it's possible you could sell $5 million mansions in a tenth the time that somebody else is struggling to sell $100,000 apartments or condos. Um, so that is a job where input and output are highly disconnected. Um, coding and sales, what else? Well, actually building any product and selling any product. And fundamentally, what else is there? So what you don't necessarily want to be in is a, uh, a support role, like a customer service kind of role. For example, customer service, unfortunately, um, inputs and outputs map relatively closely towards each other. The amount of hours put in matters. Um, so it helps to move towards things that have these uh, skill sets where it's very hard to match inputs to outputs. Of course, all the people selling get rich quick advice, you know, for $20, like that's all complete nonsense. All the people giving you stock tips or crypto tips on Twitter, complete nonsense. Um, these are all fake signals. There are no get rich quick schemes. That's just somebody else trying to get rich off of you. It's surprising to me actually how many people fall for them. It's kind of sad. Why, yeah, why, why do you think people fall for them? There's a certain desperation and a certain hunger for money in our society, which I kind of feel bad about, which is why I did you know, partially all the how to get rich work to help people figure out the principles of making money or creating wealth, I should say. Um, it's that people are so desperate for how to figure that out that even when they know that this thing is probably scammy, it's probably a waste of time, this guy probably doesn't know what he's talking about, he might have a good tidbit in there, right? They're so desperate. And it's, it's a little sad because making money, as I was saying, it, it's an inevitable byproduct of learning. Ben Franklin has a, he has many great quotes, many great sayings. One of his sayings is, Many people die at 25, but they are not buried till they are 75. What does he mean by that statement? 
What did Ben Franklin mean by that? What he meant by that is that from the age of 26 to 75, it was a living corpse. And what he meant by that is that what happens with a lot of humans is that they stop learning when they finish school. And that's probably one of the worst things you can do in terms of your development. So when Franklin says that many people die at 25 and are buried at 75, it means that at 25, they stop growing and stop learning. And so what happens with a lot of people who go to IIT or a lot of elite institutions, they don't go very far in life, even though they did really well academically. And the reason they don't go very far in life is because they are not learning machines. They have just learned what they knew in school, and then they stop learning. I would say that the most important skill to uh, getting rich is becoming a perpetual learner. Okay, you have to know how to learn anything you want to learn. Uh, there should be no book in the library that scares you, whether it's a math book or a physics book or an electrical engineering book or a sociology book or an economics book. You should be able to take any book down off the shelf and read it. And guess what? A number of them are going to be too difficult for you. That's okay. Read them anyway. Then go back and reread them and reread them. When, you ha when you're reading a book and you're not understanding a lot of what it's saying and there's a lot of confusion in your mind about it, that, that confusion is similar to the pain, the burn that you get in a gym when you're working out. You're, but this time you're building mental muscles instead of building physical muscles. So just learn how to learn and, and read the hard books. And now let me leave you with some reflections. Stop learning after school. Quote from Charlie Munger. I constantly see people rise in life who are not the smartest, sometimes not even the most diligent, but they are learning machines. They go to bed every night a little wiser than they were when they got up. And boy does that help, particularly when you have a long run ahead of you. End of quote. Quote from Naval Ravikant. If you're a perpetual learning machine, you will never be out of options for how to make money. You can always see what's coming up in society, what the value is, where the demand is, and you can learn to come up to speed. End of quote. Ultimately, the most common way to escape the rat race is to be an entrepreneur and build businesses. And there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur, in words of Shopify's president. Remember, remember that the cost of failure right now is the lowest it's ever been in the history of the world. And the reason for this is that in today's world, you have free leverage at your disposal. Your website, app, or media content are essentially assets that can earn while you sleep. In words of Navarro Vikant. So an army of robots is already here. It's very cheaply available. And the bottleneck is just figuring out intelligent and interesting things to do to them. And the way out of this bottleneck is to be a perpetual learner.